I want to kill the king. Have fun storming the castle. Think it'll work? Right? It would take a miracle. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay. Welcome, kings, princes, and governors, to the 182nd episode of An Unearthly Podcast, streaming live on the 16th of November, 2016, and featuring class, Bravish Heart, written by Patrick Ness. I am Bill Sylvia, the man in black, and I have gotten increasingly bad at actually checking what our opening bump is before we start streaming. <laughs> With me yeah. are Mad Matt Winchell... I have a pip boy. Randy Ronson McCulloch. Yeah, I didn't check it either, but I spent most of the day unconscious. What's your excuse? Class. <laughs> Aaron Romeo Moon Burke. Now now hosting no hosting on Romeo Moon One. <laughs> Tim the Enchanter Sheridan. Hey, boo -boo. And the return mm -hmm. of Miles Reed Lovato. Good evening, I have coffee. Yay. Coffee's oh. always good. It's so either coffee or tea. If it wasn't either of those two, I'd be feeling offended. I'm I'm having uh I'm drinking high sea orange at the moment. I wonder if Biscoff makes a drink <clears throat> made out of cookies. No. Stop. Just 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 I mean, no. I've had a snickerdoodle drink. <laughs> but not made by Biscoff. Oh, God. It's like eating cookie dust. It leaves your mouth dry and crummy. Biscoff. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Go on to the they birthdays. They have hot Biscoff milk. Wow. Aaron. <laughs> God damn it. Focus. <laughs> Focus. <laughs> Do you have like a deal with Biscoff? Right. Don't we wish? I wish. They, they slip. They slipped her a hundred dollars, and she didn't let us know. No. <laughs> no, I I need to take her to the doctor to get her pills to compensate for the OSS she's having. Ooh, shiny syndrome. Yeah. Do they actually make pills to compensate for that? I don't know. No, it just makes things more shiny. It makes everything shiny to compensate. I would say Ritalin, but I would that could also have the exact that, opposite effect where yeah. it gets worse. That's why I said Adderall. Besides, yeah. Ritalin's just a mild form of speed. I know. I was on it as a kid. Which I, have no, I have no memories from the years I was on Ritalin. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Your local pharmacist providing you with gateway drugs. So, uh, birthdays. <laughs> We've gone from cookies to drugs. This will only get worse <laughs> if we don't go on to birthdays. Think, will someone think nope. of the children? I don't think it could go even worse unless we start doing drugs. But isn't caffeine a drug? You decide. Adam ruins everything. Okay, so birthdays. Our first birthday was on Thursday the 10th, right after our last podcast, and was for Neil Gaiman, a famous writer, wrote The Doctor's Wife, Nightmare in Silver, also uh, a whole bunch of uh, books. Follow him uh, and Neil himself on Twitter. He also did, uh, was it Sandman? Yep. yep, I'm holding volume one in my hands right now. Oh, God, I have the it first... American Gods, which I believe is volumes? being adapted into a TV show. Mm -hmm. Possibly. It's getting um, adapted, yes. Um, and, of course, one of our favorite writers, because he's actually um, lives in Wisconsin now. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I did not know that. Hi, Oh, Neil. yeah. We've tried to get him for a geek on a few times, but he's notorious for not doing conventions. I would think that it's because he's also notorious for being very busy. So he's unconventional. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, I'll have to punch you for that. <sighs> uh, Bill? <laughs> I actually have to check something here because uh, you got the one of the dates wrong. I actually am not sure if you got really? the date wrong or the day wrong. Paul Maggers, our next birthday. You have it on Friday the 12th. Friday was right. the 11th. Saturday was the 12th. Oh, because I think I wrote Friday 11-11 and then realized it was actually the 12th. So I think it is Saturday the 12th. Okay. Don't confuse me. I've had a hard enough week as it is. <laughs> anyway, Paul Maggers. It's not so proper he, Doctor Who if you're not confused six by sunup. <laughs> um, he's the creator of Iris Wild Time uh, Was a big writer for Virgin And Big Finish Turned 47 And I forgot to mention But Neil turned 56 So happy birthday to both And our big birthday happened on Monday And that would be Paul McGann The 8th Doctor Turned 57 Paul is of course still doing audio for Big Finish As well as every other little part He can find in acting careers I think there's and, still a petition out to give him a weekly series on television, but I don't <laughs> think that's happening. I, I would love to so. give him another movie, only make it in the theater this time. Make it in the theater and then have a recording of nice. it. Just actually give him an actual freaking movie. Or give him a trilogy, even better. Mm. I would love to see that. It would just It would be beautiful. Anyway... Um, our final birthday is actually today, and that is Alexa Havens, who played Esther Drummond in Torchwood Miracle Day. So she was in all of Miracle Day, which is the only reason that she qualifies for our list. She turns 36 today. Happy birthday, Alexa. Happy birthday to you. Anyway, that's it for birthdays. Okay. Moving on to episode news, we've got the uh, Cinemac trailer for Doctor Who Christmas episode Return of Doctor Mysterio uh, has been released uh, and is now viewable to the public. I thought they just, I thought they released this a while ago, though. It's, this it's, a, is... it's supposedly a new trailer and it mixes some of the stuff we've already seen together. Yeah, th this is the trailer for the cinematic version because it'll be appearing uh, in cinemas. Uh, I'm if there's new footage in it, there's not, not a lot of it. Really, but his main no. point is the fact that it's going to be in cinemas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, Fathom Events and BBC Worldwide will present uh, the special as a cinematic uh, venture here on uh, Tuesday, December 27th and Thursday, December 29th. I thought uh, it was Monday and Wednesday. That's what's listed here. Hmm. Um, the screens will include exclusive introduction and behind scenes. And a little bit uh, more on the making of the special. Yeah. Uh, that Looks is like, that yeah, is yeah, Tuesday and Thursday. Yep. Interesting. I'm wondering because Tuesdays is usually There's... five buck Tuesdays at our theater. I'm wondering if that's going to be uh, uh, different cool. for a Fathom event. Probably. I don't know. But yeah, F Fathom no. probably has some sort of Christmas movie airing on the Monday and Wednesday or something. Mm-hmm. Probably well, why the and dates. there's a little bit more on the plot. I'm not sure if we've gone over this, but the plot, spoiler alert, if you don't want to hear anything about this, turn away now. Uh, the 60-minute special sees the Doctor joining forces with an investigative journalist and a superhero to save New York from a deadly alien threat. Uh, it's not too detailed, but... I, I, I think we have it. heard that. Okay. We've heard vagities about it, at least, yeah. Yeah. See, all this fiction talks about investigative journalists, and then I look at modern day, and I'm not sure that's still a thing. I'm actually, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm actually wondering if the investigative journalist and the superhero is the same person. There might be investigative uh, Instagram accounts. <laughs> well, the thing is, we don't know when this takes place. That's true. true. This could be a period piece, technically. Mm-hmm. I mean, if they made it like kind of an 80s period piece and... Uh, oh, yeah, I was thinking of the 80s or 70s. That would still be a thing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on. Uh, new Series 10 writers have been announced. Uh, we've confirmed 
uh, Rona Munro and new series writer Jamie Matheson, uh, who have also written episodes before for David Tennant's Doctor. Uh, Rona Munro wrote uh, the final story in the original series of Doctor Who Survival, first shown in 1989. So uh, take that one how you will. Survival is kind of a mixed bag by fans. Mm-hmm. We, Isn't I've, I mean, it's other than being weak, the weak episode of a very strong season, I haven't heard much in the way of negative feedback about I, it. I really like Survival, personally. Um, yeah. It's a... In, in its own way, it's a nice little final episode. It, it does have a fitting run. accidental monologue for the show. Um... That's the well, speech that was never intended to end the I, show. I, I have heard it. of people that don't like the episode, so I'm just going to say take it as you will. I'm personally fine. I'm personally fine with it, but you know, I was just going to say take it as a positive or a negative in your eyes. Ah. If you take it as a negative, reminder that that was in 1989. So this person has had, you know, three decades. Th- <laughs> Almost three decades. I was trying well, to do the exact math. Well, speaking we, of that, she she has ri- written for Lady Bird, Lady Bird, Oranges and Sunshine, and Amy and Jaguar. And she's also, um, she will be writing episode nine, uh, The Eaters of Light, for the new series. And she's the first classic writer to be returning. Look, why is Doctor Who News using an apostrophe to signify a plural? <laughs> <laughs> written 11 dramas. And I thought it was like Eleven's drama for a second because they, uh, because uh, the editors for these are amateurs, <laughs> or maybe because they have to get them up fast. Hey, Doctor Who I mean, news. Brandy could I edit mean, for you. I, I've heard I've heard even worse uh, editing actually done by our local newspaper here. In fact, it pretty much got somebody fired. Exactly. They, uh, that's what bad editing is supposed to do. <laughs> this was particularly bad because it turned a word into a swear word. And it was in the banner headline. <laughs> yeah. Kind of want to know now. <laughs> I can't remember the exact one. I just remember it. It's like, ooh, someone's getting fired. You always said a dirty word. Oh. What was the word Belgium. No. I did. Re- I did recently see a uh, a post on Facebook. It was uh, something Flickr, but the font they used completely bollocks that up and turned it into a fucker. <laughs> <laughs> Not good. All right, and of course, Jamie Matheson has written Mummy on the Orient Express and Flatline, and will be uh, um. I believe writing, yeah, writing episode five. He also co-wrote The Girl Who Died. I do and, believe we had announced Jamie Matheson via cult yeah. box earlier. Yeah, we so did. The, the big news this week is Rona Monroe, and that was the one that was the unnamed uh, classic Who writer returning. That we were Which, trying to figure out. I believe that was one of our guesses, wasn't it? Uh, no, it was not. We, yeah, I don't think it came up. It is good because I know uh, there's recently been talk about a severe shortage of female writers in Modern Who, so it is nice to see a classic female writer turning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wonder if she thinks her career is kind of going full circle. <clears throat> Kid me. She All started right. it writing for Doctor Who, mm-hmm. and now here she is writing for Doctor Who. Mm-hmm. It's worth noting that if I remember properly, she's also the one who suggested that there was intended to be a uh, lesbian subtext in that episode that nobody really ran with. It, I believe that was her. I might be mistaken. It might be worth looking up, but I think that was her that said that. Uh, so, link. Not sure whether that's going to have anything, any bearing on anything, but I doubt it. But anyway, notable. yeah. All right, so we've got, speaking of Jamie Matheson and the stories that he will be writing for season 10, we've got the guest cast announcement. Uh, We'll be looking at... All right, so we'll be looking at Kieran Bue, Justin Salinger, uh, Peter Caulfield, Mimi 
Nidwini, and Karen Braben are all going to be guest appearance here. So Peter Caulfield sounds really familiar. Heard the name before. Hmm. Of course, Matt Lucas. There's much talk about Matt Lucas reprising his role as Nar Nardo. We know that. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. We just don't know how long Nardo is going to last. We've seen I, pictures. Wasn't of there him. mention that he was only going to be in a couple of episodes? Or he would I... have, but he has to be in at least a little bit past the Christmas special, mm -hmm. because we've seen him and. Um, the new companion on set at the same time. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I'm sure it'll come out ahead. Mm. <clears throat> punny, Tim. Punny. <laughs> but All we right, don't. So... What, but we don't know if that means that he leaves in the first episode or if he stays <laughs> on for until the second or third. I know he's probably not going to make the half season mark. No, he probably won't. Probably. Hang on, I'm just doing a quick search of Peter Caulfield. I just searched mm -hmm. for him on TARDIS Data Core, and it's actually not coming up, which makes me wonder if all we've seen before was a preliminary announcement that he's, he'd show up sometime in the season. He's an English actor on, under Wikipedia. So, and uh, of course, uh, it also says on um, Cult Box that he was in Cucumber, which is written by Russell T. Davies, um, and also Banana. He was a star in that cube. Now I'm getting hungry again. Banana. Should have gotten more than just the brat from McDonald's. No, no. No. I'll survive. Hmm. Yeah. And if all you get out of cucumber and banana is hungry, I'll say we come out ahead. Yeah. <sighs> Sorry, I, see, I, had to I see productions here, but I don't think that, yeah, there's, it's just theater <clears throat> productions that he's been on. So there's nothing much mm -hmm. else. He sounded really familiar. Mm. All right. So we've also got guest casts announced for uh, Rona Monroe's uh, episode. So let me see here. Okay. We've got the uh, Rebecca Benson from Shetland, Daniel Kerr. Uh, Juwan Adoda Kun, uh, Brian Vernell, Ben Hunter, Aaron Figura, Sam Edwumni, and Billy Matthews. So, a bunch I'm of people we've with not of heard of. Yeah, a bunch of people we've not heard of. I thought I've heard of Billy Matthews before, too. You know how common a name Billy Matthews is? Probably let fairly me, common. Let me do a search. And ben we'll Hunter out. sounds familiar too, but again, <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's <clears throat> Billy Matthews in the Boondocks wiki. Maybe that's what I was thinking of. Maybe. He was also a footballer, born in 1897. I'm pretty sure not. <laughs> 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 Although the rheumatism's acting up today. Yeah, otherwise I don't see much else. But yeah. Well, that, that moves us on to class. Mm-hmm. Yep. <clears throat> class. The new episode, Detained, has some photos out. Episode 6. In which the class is thrown in detention. By yeah. Miss Quill. Yeah, I kind of got that from the next episode trailer. Mm -hmm. Detention for all of you. Ooh. Look at that last picture. Does Miss Quill have like a scar going on there? Mm. It looks like it might be. It looks, it looks like, like a, a, maybe a freshly healed cut. It's similar to the one that Charlie has above in the photo above it. Um, actually, you mean the uh, blood go down from her eye? I mean, Ch Ch Charlie definitely shows it as currently streaming. It's pretty fresh liquid. It's a little less clear in Quill's case. It mm -hmm. looks like it's either um, look dried at, look or... At the, look at the picture to the left of that. Looks like that blood, though, goes from above 
right down. So that looks like an eye scar. I'm not sure what's going on there. What I would guess based between between looking at that and between what she wrote on the board, I'm guessing she had to defend Charlie from something that scratched her face and then proceeded to put them all in detention because of that. Um, where, where are you uh, getting this concept? Because all I can read is detention. Uh, if you really? like, if, if you look, if you look at all of like between, I had to go th between like four different uh, pictures. It says sure. something about uh, danger only you put yourself in. So it seems that they're in detention for putting themselves in danger and making her defend. Okay. I thought it said, remember only you put yourself here. Um, that's also equally as possible. I don't know. Let me see here. I've got, now I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to have to go back through and see <laughs> where well, I, got I think actually from. Aaron is right because uh, I'm looking at one of the other pictures and I see an M E over there. <clears throat> yeah. It's so all you need to do is add. You the... put yourself here. It's basically your, it's your typical detention. Okay, kind of so yeah. I might have just so seen that you're, ER you're feeding and way too much into a pill. <laughs> you're feeding a lot into it that's not there. So I think yeah, it's honestly. Plus, I don't think she has that compulsion if they successfully removed the. Uh... They haven't yet. She just made the appointment last episode. Yeah, yes. but we don't know how much time has passed. Yes. Remember, she was going to go in Monday. I'm going to go ahead and say that because Charlie's bleeding f from his eyes and everything, uh, the same and he's place. holding the stone, I think she may have gotten a hold of the stone and also wound up bleeding from her eye. Mm -hmm. He may have snatched, like, maybe the stone was about ready to kill her, and he may have snatched it away in order to save her. Possibility. Uh, I also, don't think I don't I don't think so. Possibility, Again, but it's not that, entirely likely. That, we don't know. There's not there's not a lot of connection. To last picture. Quill yeah, says she's got a the lot gun longer. in her hand. Yes, but look where the blood goes. It right. goes. It starts it's, above the eye. Yeah, for him the blood was coming out of his eyes and nose. For her, that's clear. Mm. I it could be the thing like in her it. head trying to claw its way out or trying to kill her. That's what I was wondering if she had a scar or something from them removing it. I don't know. Um, Which might pardon. also be the reason why she put them in detention is so she could get removed and all of a sudden extra craziness happens. We don't There's know. There's also a scene where Charlie is beginning to bleed from his eyes, but and Matthias is uh, apparently trying to pry the stone out of his hand. Or trying, it has his arms hooked around uh, <clears throat> his hands or his arm or something. I wonder if I wonder if the stone somehow stems from him discovering that she's removed the thing and is pissed oh, off now. Actually, uh, looks like uh, he's possibly strangling somebody. Oh yeah, that's Tanya on the ground. It it's looks like Charlie's Tanya down trying there and... to kill Tanya, and Matthias is trying to stop him. Or... Actually, uh, no. There's like per people right. There's a person's head right by their hands. Yeah, I know. You can see if you look. Oh wait, no, it's not Tanya. It might be Rom. Yeah, I'm thinking it might be Rom hair. because it's dark hair. Yeah. It's dark hair, and then Tanya, if you look down in the corner, yeah, she's, she's, in, she's the down in the corner. Watching. So it has to be somebody else. So it's most yeah. likely Rom. He's trying to strangle for some reason. Rom, or maybe April. Or April's or more person. brownish hair. I'm this wondering if there's some kind of kind of like a possession parasite going around. Well, Could that be. has something to do with that stone for sure. I can almost guarantee I, you that. I think it looks more like. You know, they're probably trying to get the stone because the head is in front of where his hands would be. Hmm. So maybe it's actually yeah. both guys trying to pry the stone from him? Three guys trying to pry the stone from him. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. We'll have to find yeah. out, yeah. I mean, other than that, <laughs> I mean, we don't get much else from these pictures because they're all on the same set. This looks like it might have been a bit of a bottle episode. Yeah, something to do on the cheap to help the budget yeah. along for the rest of the season. Because it looks like it's all going to be taking place, except for maybe the opener and closer in the detention room. Right. Well, what episode is this tomorrow, next time? This like is episode, episode six. This is episode six. This is three quarters of the way through the series. Okay. And we don't know whether or not seven and eight will be a double header yet. Okay. I suspect probably since they did a mid season one, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll have to wait well, I mean, and see. in terms of double release like they did with one and two. Mm -hmm. It's also possible. Hmm. Oh, that reminds me. 
I should see if we know what the next episodes are going to be called yet. Yes, I think they actually have them listed now. I know. I think I was only missing the last one. I last was week, but... last one or two. Uh, let's checked. see. So this one's this one's detained. Um, the next one is the metaphysical engine or what Quill did. And the final one will be called the Lost. And according to this, they're going They'll to be air dropped off on an island. Um, according to this, they are airing a week apart, so there's not going to be another doubleheader. Okay. But they still might be part one and part two, technically. Might but be. I'll have to wait and see. Anywho, that's all we can get out the images. Yeah, that's about all we can figure out from there. So. And that moves us on to uh, book announcements. And we have the fact that the Pirate Planet, originally written by uh, Douglas Adams for the screen, is going to be novelized, or has been novelized, and is going to be released, written by James Goss. Uh, the hugely powerful Key to Time has been split into six segments, all of which have been disguised and hidden throughout time and space. Now the even more powerful White Guardian... The White Guardian is not more powerful than the Key to Time. Thank you, Blurb. Uh, wants the Doctor to find the pieces. With the first segment successfully retrieved, the Doctor, Romana, and K-9 trace the second segment of the key to the planet Califrax. When they arrive at exactly the right point in space, they find themselves on exactly the wrong planet, Xanak. Ruled by the mysterious Captain, Xanak is a happy and prosperous planet, mostly. If the mines run out of valuable minerals and gems, then the Captain merely announces a new golden age and they fill up again. It's an economic miracle, so obviously something's very wrong. Yeah, we've reviewed this episode. Yes. Um, so we know what it is. Again, this is one of those uh, books that Douglas Adams did not give permission to uh, uh, have written um, in the uh, course of his life. Um, much like Shada in that aspect, that now that he's his dead, he's dead. His estate has, you know, licensed it out, or the BBC just went ahead and did it. I'm not sure what the legal clause there was. What would Doug Douglas Adams do? Yeah, I think it was they had to give him first. Uh, he, he they had to give him first pass while he was alive, but now that he's not, they probably don't. Yeah, they and that the, or it fell to his estate, and they well, yeah, had a different they, point of view. Yeah, they had to give him first pass while he was alive, and the problem is that the rate the BBC wanted to do to make the novelization, uh, Douglas Adams could make more money uh, writing one of his other series, Hitchhikers, Dirk Gently, etc., and would get a better rate out of it. So he was like, why would I bother? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Plus, of course, uh, when he left Doctor Who, he had a very narrow... Um, mindset towards it and i think that maintained through the rest of his life yeah he a lot of people seem to be very bitter when they left doctor who in the 80s yeah jnt didn't exactly injure himself with mm -hmm. so this is going to has to be uh yeah, this is the same guy that adapted the uh, City of Death last year, which was another one that Douglas Adams just had his fingers say, in. I think I remember that name. And I think they've already done an adaptation of Shada. And uh, I know they did an ad adaptation of Destiny when Douglas Adams only had a, a, a tiny sliver in that one. Um, Mostly so he wrote I think the tongue that, cheek stuff, which was fun. So I think this will be the end of du the uh, Douglas Adams contributions there. And I think every uh, just about every other serial has been novelized by now. Well, depending on, of course, how much he actually rewrote his script editor, because we really don't know how m much he did. Mm -hmm. And this is when they take the hit the Hitchhiker's novel, Life, the Universe, and everything, and copy and paste all the names out and to make it the original um, novelization of Doctor Who and the Cricket Man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he was actually writing that as a Doctor Who uh, serial, and then just decided, now nah, this would work better as Hitchhikers. This is weird course, enough to be Hitchhikers. I bet you it'll of work course, really well. Well, Life, the Universe, and everything was also his protest against Doctor Who. Yeah. Because um, 
Slaughter Bartfist was kind of his Dr. XB in a way. And Zaphoid Beeblebrox was the, or not Zaphoid, a Ford Prefect was the anti-doctor. Whereas, you know, the doctor, given the choice of saving the universe and going to a good party, would save the universe. Ford Prefect, given the same choice, would go to the good party. That's kind of wondering what Arthur Dent would do if he had traveled with the doctor. Probably would become a better person, but that's kind of what happens with people traveling with the doctor. He'd become a better person, but he'd also suddenly realize just how insignificant his life really is in the massive universe. And be depressed I, I, about I, it. I, I, I would kind of hope that he would kind of go the Donna Noble method. Maybe. I, I don't know. I, I think he'd go to Harry Sullivan route. <laughs> Or the Mickey Smith route. Maintain the zero level till the very end and then go out the hero. Mm hmm. Oh, anywho, way so, off topic. So back well, to no, Big Finish. <laughs> only kind of sort of off a topic. And yeah, now we're moving out to uh, our Big Finish, our last couple sections here. And Big Finish, once again, has provided us with a lot of new news. Uh, first of all, we have a couple of things that are now out, uh, released from Big Finish. The first of which is the Ravielli Conspiracy. Um, I believe we've mentioned this before. Yes, I know we have. Mm -hmm. We mentioned it in Upcoming. Yep. And yeah, but I, I, I mean, I'm looking at it and I, I, I remember the cover. Ravioli. Ravielli. And this is starring... Mr. Ravioli. Um, Maureen O'Brien and Peter Purvis. When the TARDIS lands in a house in Florence in Italy in 1514, it isn't long before the guards of Gilano de Merisi arrest Stephen and Vicky. To rescue them, the doctor has to employ the help of the house's owner, one Niccolo Machiavelli. But can he be completely trusted? Giuliano confesses, confesses to his brother Pope Leo X that he has angered the wealthy family of Ravelli and believes the newcomers may be part of an assassination plot. But when the doctor arrives, an already tricky situation starts to spiral out of control. As the city rings with pl plot and counterplot, betrayal and lies abound. The doctor and his friends must use all their integrity if they're not to be, to be swept away by history. The conspiracy is about to be complicated. Hmm, sounds more like a straight-up historical. Pretty much. It, well, this it is, I mean, it's, it's basically doing the first doctor era, so this would be yeah. the era for, for the historical. For historical, well, if, yeah. Even then, um... Uh, Big Finish, I know, I think has done a couple uh, fourth and fifth Doctor historicals as well, possibly even sixth. Uh -huh. So they're n it's not unheard of for them. It just they just, I mean, they they have more of a range, more of a range, and more chances to do things. They they have done a few. I know that they've done a, a seventh one, which is set in no man's land during World War um, One. Mm -hmm. uh, this is part of Doctor Who: The Early Adventures. So you can subscribe to all four stories or apparently get it independently. Although I do not see costs on this news on this news piece. Usually about 20 bucks for a big pack. Also released is Torchwood Outbreak. Again, I believe we've mentioned this one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First you first they know you, then you love, then you kill. Incubation, Prodomo, Invasion. A medical trial's gone terribly wrong, and one of the test subjects is loose on the streets of Cardiff. Within hours, a virus is raging out of control, and the bodies start piling up. The government scrambles to control the outbreak, but isn't too keen on anyone finding out about the dark history of the virus. Captain Jack Harkness has encountered the infection before and knows that something alien is hiding inside it. With the city sealed off and murderous mobs rampaging through the streets, Torchwood has to save something even more important than the human race. So it's zombies. Zombies. Bloody zombies. Um, a bloody tortured zombie story. Wouldn't mind a little zombies and Doctor Who once in a while. Be interesting. Uh, so this one can be bought exclusively from Big Finish for twenty pounds on a for download. Or are. a CD release, which unlocks the digital version. The price goes up to twenty five pounds and thirty pounds respectively on general release. So make a yeah. So uh, get the pre-release if you can. Um, and this will um, these releases will continue next year with Torchwood One before the fall. 
which I believe we've mentioned as well. Yep. We recently, yeah, we recently. <clears throat> so I don't see the U.S. prices, but it's probably going to be twenty dollars for the uh, download. Thirty and then so for the CD, yeah, something like that. Okay, so upcoming, we've got a whole bunch of Fourth Doctor covers for February, March, and April's Doctor Who Fourth Doctor Adventures. Uh, we have Doctor Who, The Eternal Battle. The TARDIS lands on a battleground on an alien world where sun tyrants and humans are at war. But what are the vicious feral creatures that are hunting in this wasteland? Doctor Who, The Silent Scream. The travelers are enjoying Hollywood in the 1920s, only discover that a deadly force is taking the voices of movie stars and monstrous silhouettes around the prowl. And finally, it's Doctor Who, Deathrus. The TARDIS arrives on a sunken World War II submarine, but there is more to this crippled ship than meets the eye and a mystery to solve before the outside pressures rip it apart. Cover is very Rocket Man. Mm-hmm. Actually, all these covers look really interesting. Hmm. Also, there's a random ape. And these are all Doctor, Fourth Doctor and Leela. Also, the Silent Fourth Doctor Scream. and Romana too. You mean? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, Lala Ward. Sorry, I, I I read them wrong. I saw I saw Louise Jamison. My brain just completely replaced the name on me. Yeah. So these are all Fourth Doctor and. You Romana. saw Lala and thought Leela. No, I actually yeah. saw Louise Jameson. Ah. My brain is literally playing tricks on me. <laughs> I'm going to blame uh I'm going to blame the 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 stressful week I've had and uh Are the, you going to do a cover of the ghetto boys? Huh? What? What was that? <laughs> I was referring to the ghetto boys song my mind's playing tricks on me. No. I thought that was Green Day. No, never mind. I don't know. Over my head. All I know is that I like the Silent Scream one in particular because it reminds me of Flash Gordon. Oh, yeah, oh. with the lightning bolts? Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, so... Um... It seems looks Dan like... Starkey is doing all of the classic Centaurans now because the uh, <laughs> Eternal Battle is featuring Dan Starkey. Dun, dun, okay, dun. so um, what you have here was the uh, Unit 4 box set news. Yep. Um, that the unit assembled is going to feature not just the current unit crew, which is what you'd expect of Kate Stewart and Osgood, but we're also going to see the return of Katie Manning as Joe Jones, uh, Richard Franklin as Mike Yates, and John Levine as John Benton. Now, this is news because Benton had showed up to Big Finish for one audio, had a lot of disagreements, and basically stormed off saying he would never work at Big Finish again. Wait, what was this? Um, John Levine. This, he had showed up to do Benton for a big finish audio. I don't remember when, but apparently he objected to the state of the studio, made some very disparaging comments, and swore he'd never work at Big Finish again. Um, apparently, Nick Briggs has been talking with him and has convinced him to come back. Uh, we'll see how this holds out. Yep. Hmm. It would be nice to get Benton back. Benton was a good guy. Yeah. And then finally, we have a trailer for the Contingency Club. I have not heard the trailer. Have you, Bill? I listened to the trailer. I didn't get much out of it. They did mention uh, the name Peabody, so I don't know if that means that this is the uh, founder of the museum, Peabody, or just a coincidence, but... Other than that, I really didn't get didn't get anything out of the trailer. Let's see. The TARDIS uh, seemed like a, cla a standard, either historical or semi-historical. I actually. listened to it too, and it does sound very much like it's trying to be a historical of some kind. Mm -hmm. Okay. The TARDIS lands inside the most exclusive gentleman's club in all of Victorian London. The Doctor and his companions have broken all the rules, but what's the penalty? Jeez, they should have made this a Diego and Lightfoot. A Diego and Lightfoot. <laughs> It would have been absolutely perfect to have them in there. 
Maybe That'd they'll be... appear in it. I don't know. I still need so... to get into Jago and Lightfoot. <laughs> so that's really all the big finish news that we have. Well, there's plenty of material to get into, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> to what, 12 seasons or something? Yes, something like that yeah. now? Yeah. <laughs> it's That's like one of the most prolific things outside the main series, I swear. Okay, the, so that is all of the Big Finish news and all of our regular news. So for a few minutes here, um, Miles and I are going to talk a bit about Power of the Daleks. I also Hooray. have stuff to add. So apparently of everybody on the podcast, it was only Miles and I that got to go see it in the theaters. Um, Aaron, unfortunately, had to work for it. I found some articles, though. <clears throat> And Bill elected at the prices uh, not to go see it since it is going to be shown starting Saturday on BBC America. Oh, Albeit, it is? Okay. I might be able to catch it then. It's going to be episodic, though. Like it's how often like, episodic? But it, do, like we know, do we know when, the, when, they put it, when they put it on their website, is it going to be the whole thing or is it going to be one at a time? I suspect it'll probably they'll probably put up the episode after they air it. So it's probably going to be one a week. But it's going to be one episode every Saturday, uh, right before Dirk Gently, from what I've seen. Um, so my opinion of it is, um, for the first half hour, the animation still seemed a bit stilted for me. But pretty much once the Daleks got involved, um, you never, you didn't notice anymore. The Daleks, I swear, were made to be animated. And um, I think that probably the scenes with the Daleks were probably better done in the animation than the original live action, <laughs> considering the fact that the animator could animate all of the Daleks rather than just having a whole bunch of cardboard cutouts in the back. Um, the uh, drawing style was okay. Um, Troughton looked great. I did kind of feel like Ben had the same expression throughout the entire serial, which kind of made it look like he just like he had just been sucking on a lemon. <laughs> um, Polly was decent, and most of the secondary characters were decent. Um, other than that, it's pretty good. It's probably one of the better serials that, uh, or animation uh, versions we've seen thus far. And I think I've just about seen all of them by now. So, so uh, way back you gave this episode a three. What do you think of it now? Oh, I've been debating that. I think I still can't go higher than a four, but I think it does get the four now. Um, there are some scenes that would have been better had it actually been Patrick Troughton. I think rather than his animated self, other scenes that he that the animation was fine for, but a lot of like the early stuff in particular, um, I think it would have been better to actually have seen it done by Troughton. I can imagine. That. Um, the scenes Zonch that were probably isn't all that giddy. And but um, the Daleks came through okay, and the Daleks I think were definitely improved. This, I should point out, was not a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Um, the, uh, it's about 50% directed by the original director and 50% directed by the new guy, so take that how you will. Um, Do you know if any of the dialogue or anything like that was changed or just the appearances? No, no, the dialogue was still the original dialogue. Okay. It was still the original I'm, I'm audio. I'm sure some of the long, need, unneeded scenes probably got cut down because they don't have to have this for 1960s TV anymore. No, I'm pretty sure it was pretty attacked. This... It was... Go ahead. Um, This was pretty much how I remember, you know, how I remember it from my old... Doctor Who The Missing Adventures, narrated by Tom Baker, cassettes I had when I was 13. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was pretty word for word. Yeah. I didn't think, I, I didn't feel like anything was cut anywhere. 
Like I said, um, that maybe the fluff. Like there's there was apparently what I recall from trying to l- watch it or listen to it rather that there were long stretches of just noise. Nope, there were still long stretches of just noise, but now you could actually see what was going on. Hmm. Mm-hmm. I and guess that, that made, would help. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's that that's made the difference. All the when difference you, when you're staring at a single telesnap of like a factory and just hearing the noise, it just doesn't have the effect that actually mm-hmm. seeing the factory moving does. And I believe Bill had the question: Well, where were the Dalek? Uh, where you know did they? Where were they getting the Daleks to go in the machines in there? You actually get to see that in this. Oh, nice! You see them fishing the Daleks out of what must have been like a birthing tank. Mm-hmm. Uh, giving them electroshock therapy to waking them up and throwing them in the in the uh, in the tardis in the Dalek shells. So the first thing they wake up to is nothing but pain. Yep. And then they that's... shove them in a cold metal shell, and you wonder why the Daleks are the way they that, are. That sounds very Dalek. It was <laughs> it, it, it was it was done perfectly in the animation. I'm just like, yep. You can still see the thing going, you know, shaking with the with with anger and electric uh, electric shock as they're shoving it in there too. It was mm-hmm. powered by electromagnetism uh, and rage. And, and don't then they try give, to tell them uh, otherwise. Or, no, it's static electricity and hate. Yeah, there we go. I, I I don't know, Miles. Have you ever done a YouTube search for the Peter Jonesy uh, version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to Daleks? Trust me, it's worth it's worth the YouTube search. Um, Miles, I uh, oh, is it my turn now? We, no, we, well, we, yeah, we you're asking you a question. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, have you have you ever heard of or looked up uh, the Hitchhiker's Guide to Daleks? Oh, I have. That that they're, they're, they're nasty, very nasty. <laughs> <laughs> Daleks heard... are nasty. Okay. Dogs do not uh, yeah. dance with their creator. <laughs> Go ahead and give give your thoughts, Miles. Um, yeah, because you know, I've been you know listening to this one since you know I was a little kid. This was this was really nice to see visually animated, though. Towards the end, when it's where you have long scenes with just the character, with just like the side characters, it felt like I was watching a very strange episode of Archer or C Lab twenty twenty one. Yes, where it's yes. Being played absolutely straight. Which, yeah. But for the most part, I really, you know, I really, you know, I really enjoyed it. The story was really, you know, actually watching the story. Um, it feels a lot more, you know, a lot more pace and a lot more nuance than going by a reconstruction or just listening to the soundtrack with narration. Mm-hmm. I actually got more of a sense of some of the, the side characters, which I didn't. And I forgot how utterly freaky Troughton is, and that how utterly disconcerting Troughton is in the first episode, in the first few episodes. Yeah, because in in this episode, he's kind of meant to keep you guessing: is he the Doctor? Is he not the Doctor? Is he somebody who just switched places with him? And oh wow, we did power the Daleks oh. way back in season two. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh. I think that was our first. I think that was our first one that we did that wasn't a complete episode. Maybe. Uh, I think we dreaded every moment. Did, did someone let Miles talk? Uh, anyway, yeah, sorry. But I, I think watching it much like Matt Smith, I think Troughton pretty much lands from the get-go. And his doctor is right there in those six episodes. You get all the sort of... You get the, you, you get the clowning around... But he's you, you can always tell he's six moves ahead of everyone else in the room. And it was just great to watch. Now do evil. <laughs> evil of Daleks. Cough, cough. <laughs> it's funny that you should mention that it felt like C-Lab, because I had that same thought uh, during the uh, the end of it, where, there, where the uh, rebels and everybody are trying to shoot the Daleks and everyone's dying in spades. Mm-hmm. I'm like, wow, this feels like an episode of C-Lab. <laughs> By the way, the the person who does C Lab is also the same person who does Archer, the same creator. That explains everything. Yes. <laughs> Gosh, when was the All last right. time I saw C Lab? 
<laughs> well, I have like a couple of articles to mention. We uh, we talked to, or Rand pointed out the person who made this was um, his name is actually the director is uh, Charles Norton, and he was responsible for a reconstructed an animated reconstruction of a lost episode of Dad's Army called the episode's title was A Stripe for Frasier. And I actually posted in the chat a pretty extensive article on, uh, detailing like how all the animation was done on this uh, this this episode for Dad's Army and everything. So it goes into it's pretty pretty detailed, like I said. Uh, but he does have experience with animated reconstruction, so that may be why he's on here. Um, the other uh, people involved were two comic artists who have worked for Doctor Who magazine. Adrian Salmon, or Salmon, and Martin Garetti, or Garatti. Um, so Adrian has worked on the previous uh, series, The Cybermen, for Doctor Who, as well as Judge Karen for Judge Dread magazine. He also did. He also worked at Panini Comics and worked on the Rugrats and Action Man. So he drew for those. And then there's also Martin Goretti, who is um, very, he, he's a penciler, basically, for Doctor Who magazine. Um, and started up in 1994. So, I, oh, he's also, he's the, he's the one who also drew for Big Finish. He did their comic book or their comic previews section for Big Finish. Which I think were shown, or I think I, I think are shown on occasion in Doctor Who magazine. I think is where they end up, hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Did the majority of the Eighth Doctor strip, um, when Paul McG when the Eighth Doctor was the starring um Doctor for the magazine comic strip, which is kind of hands down the best Paul McGann run, but. I, I didn't realize until like, I saw the behind the scenes, but it's like, oh, they got a lot of the comic people to do a lot of the artwork mm -hmm. which and designs, which was really cool. So, Miles. Yeah? If, if you were going to rate this episode based on what you saw, in other words, not how you would think it was probably when it originally aired, but what we have now, what would you give it? Um, is it out of five? Yeah, out of five. Mm -hmm. I would honestly have to give it a five. Really? Um, I, I admit I'm I'm gonna be pretty biased in that it was you know I it was it's I've always loved the story and to see it animated despite the kind of sea labbiness of some of the parts. Um, I really I really enjoyed it. It's a great story. Um, unabashedly, I'll I give it five out of five. All right. Because I think we're about to update the score on that episode. I was just actually working on that right now. And based only on what we have, and I can tell you, um, the first time we reviewed this, it was off a Telesnap version. Um, a Telesnap reconstruction. None of us could give it above a 3.5. Just because so much of the visual was missing, even with the Telesnaps that it was it was kind of hard to watch because it was hard to tell what was going on um this will and two of those uh scores bills and mats are still being held at that level until they can see the whole thing mm -hmm. um that will bring this up to a 3.75 or 3.9 so it's almost a four folks mm-hmm um, that will take it up from where it currently is, which I have to locate. Give me a moment. Uh, no, that's Planet of the Daleks. Speak Power locate. of the Daleks was originally 3.5 and was in place 130. Now I gotta double check this because something's not updating. Three point five is where it was moved. No, it should be that, higher. That's where it was moved to when you updated yours from a three to a four, but it's 
That's yeah. That's only focusing on the three members. Oh, oh, at the time. I, I, I that's see. Not I, I, I see. I see what's going on here. Give me a moment. I have to adjust for Miles because uh, Miles was not listed in that part of the sheet, and it's yeah. Totally... He wasn't. He wasn't part of the equation originally. Yep. So. Um, are you still over on the season two page? Yes. Uh, what column is Miles? I. I. Okay. So I just got to copy. Have this fixed in a moment. We didn't actually realize that this would happen. Um, I don't want an average there. I want. Aaron gave the end of time one out of five. I did. Apparently. Yeah, yeah she was, was. She wasn't. She wasn't fond of of the tenant ending thing. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. So that will adjust that ranking. It now says three point eight. So it was at one thirty with the new sort, and I'll have to sort twice tonight. It shoots up the list to uh, 96. So jumped up 34 places. I was going to say at least 20. Yeah. So it's looking better, and we'll see uh, the, re uh, the revised when Matt and Bill takes a look, and then Erin will be able to put her two cents in since I'm taping it and she can watch it. So it's gonna be and once one a week for the next I've, couple months. <laughs> it's gonna be yeah. one a one a week for the next six weeks. Yeah. Yeah. So I um <sighs> I have actually reviewed I think Evil of the Daleks, didn't we? Yeah, we did. We already? did that one in season three. Yep. Mm -hmm. One, two, three, four, five. So it should get done on Christmas Eve. My my Christmas is gonna be a cluster of things, isn't it? All right, so we have that rating in. We have that done. Uh, anybody else have anything to say about Power of the Daleks? All right, I had one more piece of news I got this week. Actually, I think I might have got it last week, but I forgot to announce it. It has nothing to do with Doctor Who at all, so I'm just leaving it for this little bit. And that is the animated series Young Justice has finally got its season three renewal. Whoa. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was actually announced, I think, the day after Election Day. It was either the day after or on Election Day. Something like that. It was something I think no, I, meant, I think it was I, like 12 hours of, oh, my God, really posts followed by 12 hours of Young Justice it was something like that. I, I it was like the only good news I got that week. Um, <laughs> either way, um, I haven't seen what it's getting renewed on. I'm assuming Netflix, but I don't know that for certain. But it is getting a. It is finally getting the third season that everybody wanted. Um. So, yay. You know, you, you know the reason it was canceled, don't you? So yes. Be so that's a, another point in 2016 favor. Too bad there's too, too bad there's too many big negatives. And we lost a bill there. Did you? I, I heard yes, B, oh. and then you died. No, oh, I was. Yeah, I didn't really verbalize much after that. It was more shaking my head as audibly as possible yeah no, well. the re the reason it got canceled is because um it was not reaching the demographic they were trying to aim for i Which heard was, it was just that there were too many females also watching that's the they were aiming for young men they were getting young women oh that is so yeah. dumb and Girls that's why don't was, buy action figures. And that's why it was can't that was and that was the second part of it is that girls were less likely to buy the toy. 
I hope that means that they're not going to like boy. to cut characters like Megan out of season. I doubt it. I, I I really doubt it because that would just make the fans even more angry. Yeah. Um, I see toy. And I don't think if it's if it's being renewed for Netflix, I don't think Netflix cares as long as people are down are are, are streaming it. Mm-hmm. Is it Nev? Or last I heard, they didn't know what studio they were working like what channel or Netflix or what it was going to be with, unless that's been updated. No, I, I, that's why I'm theorizing if it's Netflix. Gotcha. Because I know they were trying to get Netflix to, 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 uh, to pay for it. And Netflix said, well, we'll see. We'll take a look at how many people are streaming it. We'll see it. So the fact that we're seeing this getting renewed now, right? I, I, it might be that it's going to be Netflix exclusive. I'd be okay with that. So would I. Because Netflix is – And then we'd get it all on one day. Yes. I could just see Bob now. Not coming into game today, watching Young Justice. Yes. <laughs> just remind me when to re-up the uh, Netflix. Yeah, Speaking of which just got Netflix here, so. fixed on my end, so I can start watching stuff now. Okay. So now it's 15 after, and now we get to that wonderful part of our thing. We get to the episode summary in two and a half minutes or less. If you all remember, I did it last week. And I did it with a Canadian accent. And lost most of our audience. Thanks. <laughs> no, just isolated. Just just pissed off Canada, which I if Canadians are still listening. I'm sure they they've know. apologized for getting pissed off by now. <laughs> if Canadians are listening, they know by now that I tend to rant against Canada after they abducted my mother. All they, need, all they to need to do is Canadian. make offerings of maple syrup and I'll leave them alone. Of course, I may be joining them if things go wrong here. Mm-hmm. A whole bunch we of us are going to move to that northern border. Yes, okay. I, I, I have heard the other end of that is that, yes, there's plenty of room in Canada, but most of it is a place you don't want to live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're fine with living in the ice... In the of forest. the northern territories... <laughs> You may need to learn how. You may need to learn how to ride moose. On the other hand, known fact that the Led Zeppelin song "Immigrant Song" is actually all about Canada. (laughs) Or Wisconsin? I'm not sure yet. (laughs) How long have you been in Wisconsin? Four years. Okay, so you know we can get. So you know of our winters. Um, lived here for four, visited, been visiting here on and off for, for ten years beforehand. Oh, I am familiar okay. with your... If you weren't, I wanted to warn you. <laughs> I am familiar with your weather. Our, um, <laughs> our con chair, Chris, came here from Hawaii by, uh, or came here by, from California by way of Hawaii. Yeah. He his, experienced his winter hard. at the time was not familiar with Wisconsin winters and didn't like it. <laughs> Chris, on the other hand, is Sasquatch man and doesn't care. As seen by the time that we went to Quick Trip um, at like 11 at night, 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit, and he's in uh, a sweatshirt and shorts. <laughs> That's what I used to do when I went to, uh, to get pizza for the con meetings. And I'm like, "Aren't you cold in that?" And I'm like, he's like, "No." Not if I'm out there for any less any less than five minutes. I knew a guy and in high school. Slow. I don't know what was up with his metabolism, but he would do snow angels in shorts in that weather, and everyone <laughs> was like, "You're going to get hypothermia." And he's like, "No, actually, I'm pretty warm right now." <laughs> Some people are like that. Some people are crazy like that. I am not one of these people. He, he, it, it I, I, I may that have he was some supposed to go to uh, Xavier School, but <laughs> I, I may have some extra thermal padding, but I don't like it out there. It's so winter comes, I want to go in a corner and sleep and not wake up till spring. I'm a freaking bear. I was also lucky enough when I was working retail to get a a, uh, a coat on clearance for $10 because it had been in the back room for three years that basically you feel like you're in a toaster unless it's below 20 out. 
and you don't actually feel like it's not warm unless it's like negative 10, negative 15. Mm. Well, anyway, we're off track. We're supposed <laughs> to be. Track. That's we're true. To, yeah, we were talking. We we're supposed, we're supposed to be, supposed to be picking who the victim is for the two and a half minute yeah. challenge. Randy did last time. Did so. I I, I get the buy. Has so Miles did, ever done it? Uh, no. no, Miles hasn't. So you're up for grabs, sir. All right, I will. I will is do this. Just me, or have I not heard Tim's voice in a while? Is Tim still here? I'm here. He's oh, okay. here. I couldn't no, remember the last time I heard so your voice. So get that, get that stopwatch ready to go, Matt. It's ready. Are you ready, Miles? As ready as I'll ever be. All right. Start in three, two, one, go. Epic class. Bravish Heart. Thankfully, doesn't star my one of my least favorite Doctor Who companions. As seen, Ran, Ram, and Alice go to the plans of the Shadow King to deal some sordid death to the leader of the Shadowkin. Meanwhile, back on Earth, carnivorous flower petals. Miss, Miss Quill and the mysterious new headmistress of Cold Hill Academy want Charlie to use, to use the super soul weapon to destroy the petals and save Earth, but Miss Quill wants Charlie to use the super soul weapon to kill the Shadowkin instead and just let Earth die. But no, said the headmistress of... Cold Hill Academy. If you try and do that, I will kill Mateus, your hunky Polish boyfriend. Charlie is conflicted. Mean meanwhile, the parents of Ram and Alice, including Ram's father, who is too good for this world, try and figure out a way to re to rescue their children. On the Shadowkin planet, Alice fights the leader of the Shadowkin in a in a sword in a sword fight and attempted regicide, and wins. Does become leading of the leader of the Shadow People, the Shadowkin, and has and has the Shadowkin leader promptly locked up. Using the power of love, they open a crack in space and are able to get back to Earth. In the meantime, Mateus discovers that the petals are killed by shadows, and just before Charlie's about to use the soul is powering up the soul weapon, are able to use the Shadowkin to destroy the petals and save the Earth. But is Miss Quill still on the same side as our heroes? I wouldn't blame her. Charlie's been a bit of a dick these last two episodes. And the uh, and headmistress of Cole, Academy, Cole Hill Academy has promised to try and let get the special alien implant which allows Charlie to, to control her out of her head and achieve her freedom. Done. An end scene. All right. And Miles did it in two minutes, eight seconds. New under the wire. All right. Well, I guess it's uh, drop mic. <laughs> I guess I'm up here. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. And Matt, you're up first. Oh, wow. Not every day I get first. So, things that you like about this episode in general. Things I liked about this episode. Um, um, <laughs> I'd have to go, um, in general, very good pacing. We didn't stick too long with any one group, and each group had something very important to be doing before everything finally branched back together again in the end. It just moved. It just moved really nicely, and then you you weren't bored for any part of it at all. All right, Aaron. Our favorite, all to all overall. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, let me see here. Me, eh, eh, bring up my notes. I kind of like the idea of the carnivorous flower pills still. They're an interesting idea. I'm I'm sure that they're actually from Japanese mythology. <laughs> I'm I haven't looked it up, but knowing what I, as much as I do about Japanese mythology, I'm sure if I did, I would find them. Hmm. <laughs> but yeah, it was. They seem to be you know pretty functional villain, even though we really don't know where they came from. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, Miles, you're next. Um, I think the best part of the story was Ram's father, um, who is that rare parent in genre fiction who knows that his son and his friends are in some serious stuff, but and he doesn't he wants his son to be safe when but when push comes to shove, quite willingly jumps to an alien wormhole to save his son. I, I think he's awesome. He should get his own show. Well, he's definitely doing better than Jackie Tyler in this in this particular instance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Or Martha's mother. Oh yeah. Well, she was pretty much on the villain's patsy in that. And suffered for it. All right. Tim, what did you like overall? I really liked uh, the, the, the effects, especially the green screen, the, the tears. And... They have been doing yeah. very good effects of those. Yes, they have. Adding. Uh, it's like... I'm you're, sorry, we lost you're, you there, you're Tim. You're in and out, Tim. The... Uh... I liked the look of the Shadow Realm. It looked very convincing. Oh, yeah. It looked a little bit better this time. Okay. Very nice big Bill. quarry. <laughs> Bill. I, li I like that they did not suddenly forget that April had powers and that they not only used them functionally, but also explained why they're not going to use them again as compared to other shows, which would just forget at the beginning of the next episode that she had them. Okay. Yep. I liked actually Ram in this myself. The fact that he was able to just, you know, stick with it and, you know, not lose hope. All right. Things you didn't like. Matt, you're up first. Oh, I think the one thing that made me raise my eyebrow and just kind of go Meh, at, the, at the screen was uh, watching the sword fight. The sword fight felt a bit lackluster. The only real thing that kind of grabbed my attention just went like, you yeah. couldn't do like doubles versus, or something versus, versus the Shadow King. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You get like you, stunt you... doubles to do this a little bit better. I mean, anybody could have done this. Borrow the guys from Highlander. They knew how to do it. Oh, they would put on a hell of a show if they did it. Yeah. Aaron, what about you? What do you didn't like overall about this episode? I actually didn't like April's dad, and it's just probably from my own past. It's just that I don't know. He he's supposed to be a, a drug addict and whatnot, but he's just you know the the humor that they tried to play with him just didn't really click with me, and a lot of a lot of the stuff kind of didn't click. Like a lot of his dialogue just didn't seem to work. Yeah, but at least they didn't go with the all is forgiven hug at the end. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they played with them as 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 the the dunce who mm -hmm. doesn't believe what's going on and properly got rebuked for it. But yeah, it definitely would have been a lot more cringeworthy if they're like, "Oh, now you can come live with us. You've proven yourself." Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's proven. I was afraid. So I was afraid that's where they were going to go, and I'm glad they. Yeah, didn't. yeah. I was hoping they wouldn't do that, and thankfully they didn't. All right, Miles, your least favorite thing on the episode. <sighs> Again, I feel like I'm going to repeat my complaint with Night Visitors, in which you have this huge threat, which I, you know, I'm not sure if they're saying that the petals would would swamp the area or the world and kill everybody. But again, you, you get no... In the wider context of Doctor Who, you get no context of, you know, there is something, you know, someone's trying to do something. And again, I guess it's probably for like monetary reasons, but you, you think can they always could, have. Sorry? Think they, you think they could at least hire the newscaster lady that was in the uh, seasons of Doctor Who? That they'd be doing news reports on it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you could just have had like a oh the Briggs in Geneva like moment, where it's like units, of, you know, units away and maneuvers, or just something to to kind of link it into. There are there is stuff set up established in the Doctor Who universe, right? Which kind of deals with these things on a reg on a weekly basis in the seventies or maybe Hell, the eighties. I'm sure. I mean, even this plot is something that would have happened in Torchwood, 
I could even just imagine, like, if uh, it would have been nice to have, like, a throwaway line from uh, Miss Red Dress and be like, Torchwood's out of commission, so we can't count on them or something. Torchwood's busy over in Cardiff. Unit's busy just trying to protect the the, the mainland of Britain. But you're stuck here. <laughs> that And I think Torchwood only consists of Gwen at this point. I'll, I'll, I'll bring Kinda her up in a, in, in a moment, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tim, what was your least favorite? My least favorite thing overall was the dialogue in most of this episode because it seemed to be like 90% uh, forced exposition. Mm. Forced so exposition, like, yeah. It was like, I, where do we go? We have to go to the Shadow King. Where, what's happening? The flower petals. What's happening? We have to open a box. What's <laughs> it's like, it's like... Uh, I would, I argue, I agree with you slightly, but I mostly see that uh, with the whole. Um, use the box, kill the petals, kill the shadow thing, because they kind of got circular there. Yeah, that got very circular mm -hmm. for a while. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, we get it that there's the conflict there. Get on with it! Um, Bill? <laughs> uh, kind of related to that, I feel like, and I, I was looking more at the parents, but what you said is part of the same thing, is that it felt padded. It felt like they were trying to add an extra 10 minutes on to me because of the fact that it had to be a two-parter. And I feel like they could have given that extra 10 minutes to make it a little more believable how April just all of a sudden got through the Shadow World. They could have kind of given her things to do on the way instead yeah. of padding it out. The problem with that shortage. would have cost more effects money. That's very true. That would have cost even more budget. So you really can't show too much. Yeah, but they're reusing all the sets from last week, so they must be saving money. You'd think. Mm. But they're, they're I, reusing sets, Bill. But they have to make new effects for anything new that they try to yeah, do. Yeah, the the thing the thing is, those sets are half sets, half CGI. I'm pretty sure. And so every second they show in the Shadow World costs them money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sure like well, the center maybe, pillars were probably real, but well, I guarantee maybe you the if, backgrounds maybe, were you know, fake. I'm sure they could find a cave and make it, you know, just darken this darken the uh thing and post a little bit and be like, oh look, it's a cave in the shadow world that April has to do something in. So so. The the you're still not accounting in the fact that there any villain that shows up would again be massive digital effects. It would still cost a well, lot. Well, they more they money. they could they could always Monty Python it, and suddenly the animator suffered a fatal heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> the cartoon menace was no more. And April could continue on and get this thing over with. Okay, so my least favorite thing I have to mention is um, the headmistress lady because she's coming off as way too Torchwood in this, and I'm talking Torchwood one. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm hearing stuff that she's saying and everything, and I'm getting flashbacks to what's her face, mm -hmm. the head of Torchwood One. It's it's not pretty. It's like okay, so Torchwood One moved down, so you just had to take over Coal Hill. Is this right? It it's kind of feeling that way. I was kind of having hope with her originally, thinking she might be, you know, the board of governors then and, and might be like somebody that knew Ian Chesterton, but now no, she's a dick. Yeah, now and it's very clear that there, whoever it is behind her is a bunch of assholes and wouldn't be Ian at all. Yeah. So, yeah, she's gone from being my possible hope for this to I don't like her. <laughs> well, it's entirely possible that Ian's too busy traveling to actually do his fulfill his role as a governor and the others have kind of ran with it which would still justify a cameo at the end yeah I, I, I'm kind of hoping for a cameo but we'll see yeah it would be fantastic to have a cameo yeah, where not, he comes back and just breath, holds nice. the uh, starts going through the governors and just kind of ripping them apart for what they've been doing while he's been gone okay so favorite scene Matt you're first oh favorite scene Remember, choose one, because there's six people. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Gotta pick between children. Um, 
Actually, you know what? Actually, uh, one of the things I really did like is some of the pedal effects. So when we saw people getting attacked, and in particular the leftover bodies, was kind of interesting because you don't see that every day in Doctor Who either. Okay. Especially to that Aaron. level. Mm-hmm. Aaron, your favorite scene. I think the the one that stood out to me the most was the guy who was covered in again in flower petals, and he runs right into a, into the glass wall next to next to our group of heroes. Uh, they're inside and, a building, mm-hmm. and, and they just see mirror. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So and they just crumples. He just crumples to the ground, and they're like, "Ah, oh, we gotta get going. We gotta get to safety here." I would have thought they'd have been a bit more freaked out with than that, but yeah. But, but some the of them are already are well into this, and they're probably already kind of shell shocked from the first round. Mm-hmm. Makes you wonder how jaded they're all going to be by the end of this. <laughs> all right, Miles. Um, my favorite scene is towards the end when Miss Krill, um, Miss Quill, just decides to smash up a car. And Headmistress just walks past and goes, you realize that's not my car. Um, <laughs> little scene, but I just really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Also, they're going also that look of this quill, like, okay, whose car was that? For a moment, I thought she was going to st- actually steal it. She doesn't have moral scruples. <clears throat> yeah, I thought she was about to jack it, too. It's like, what, she needs to do petty theft? Well, actually, that would be Grand Theft Auto, but still. Why would you steal a car that you just destroyed, though? I, I, more more for reasons of therapy than anything else, but... Probably running over a cliff or something, though, too. Mm-hmm. Like Quill. <laughs> All right, Tim, favorite scene. Favorite scene is when Rom says to his dad, You never want to know. And Ron's dad says, yes, I do. If the world's ending, I want to know, be it flower petals or shadows, or I want to know. Because, <laughs> like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, it's like, you don't know the world's end. Yeah, that's not, that's not a big See, deal. Like, yes. <laughs> when you said, I'm, I'm thinking, I think this was a 12th uh, Doctor's speech. Or, no, wait, it might have been, actually, I think it was Agent K. The world is always ending. Whether it's this or that or the other thing, the world is always ending. You only stay sane because you don't know. Yeah, that was Agent K, not the yeah. Doctor. That's that's definitely an Agent Although K speech. A- Agent K and the Twelfth Doctor, that would be it. <laughs> You'd realize, god damn it, Bill. <laughs> I'm going to have to spend tonight after the podcast trying to find Doctor Who Men in Black crossover fiction now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's out, out there. there. I know mm-hmm. it is. Speaking of it's out it's there, a- X-Files oh. as well. <laughs> oh, I've already seen some of that. That's that's cool. <laughs> Let's see. So, Bill, what was your favorite scene? I'm going to say, and this might have just been because of the release of all the padding tension, but the scene where April is finally like, oh, yes, come forth, my pretties, and destroy them all. And that's not what she said, but that was the gist of the scene. Yeah, and it just felt I, like a release of all the tension, and it felt really good. Yeah, and that that'll lead to my like, scene. It's where he's finally realizing he doesn't have to use the the like uh, a, a plot the, the weapon. He's just like, "Oh God, thank you. Right. I'm putting it away now." Oh, thank God, it's turning off. Okay, back where you belong. Mm-hmm. All right, least favorite scene. Oh, gosh. And it goes back to me again. Oh, yep. Oh. yep. The dice gods talked you into number one. <laughs> At least I don't have to worry about anybody stealing one of mine. Yep. I've been lucky. Nobody's stolen any of mine yet. <sighs> My brain just keeps keep going back to that sword fight. That was just, like, the most cringy thing. It was, okay. it was very obviously a kid trying to fight with a guy in a giant <laughs> rubber suit, and it was not effective at all. Some of the close-ups helped to hide that a little bit, but they weren't perfect either. I can see through that stuff. John Pertwee, she was not. Oh, heck no. I, John Pertwee's ghost is spinning after seeing that sword fight. Uh-huh. All right, Aaron, your least favorite scene. Um, the scene of the flower petals crashing through the glass. I know, (laughs) 
I know that if you pile enough, you know, even light stuff on top of a surface like that, it will eventually crack. But it just didn't seem like there were enough flower petals to really make that glass break. And it didn't seem like that was a very large, like, sunlight or or whatever, sunroof or whatever that came well, crashing through. This is London, so I would think you would call it a rain roof. A rain roof or something. <laughs> Don't know. I don't know if they have enough sun to call it a sunroof. A fog light. <laughs> it's a it's a moon roof. It's a moon roof. No, again, that'd be a fog roof. <laughs> yes. You forget there's no sky in London, Aaron. It's just like those those have to be some pretty heavy flower petals for that few of them to fall to destroy glass like that. And it's, that it's or those petals window. must have been attacking the glass, which is a little unusual. Yeah, we don't really see the move except for when they double. Mm -hmm. And even then, it didn't seem like there were that many on there. All right. Um, Miles, your least favorite? Um, my My least favorite scene would be the non-declaration of non-love between April and Ram, because it, it was the best worst example of why only Joss Whedon can write Joss Whedon dialogue, and everyone who attempts to, it always comes off as very ham-fisted, which d their entire speech felt very kind of ham-fisted and, and just felt, it took me out of the moment of mm. we're going to have a big sword fight. Yeah. Now I'm picturing that between uh, like uh, Sarah Michelle Geller and James Marsters, but that accidentally made it more badass. <laughs> <laughs> well, he is right. Only Joss Whedon can write that kind of dialogue. The thing is, uh, if Joss Whedon was writing it, April would have died at the end. Or because she would have been trapped got... in the Shadow Realm and could be considered for dead. Yeah, pretty much. And then we'd have because... a plot twist in the last episode to suddenly bring her back. Because only J because if Joss Whedon's writing, the female lead is going to die or be lost, expected to die. I don't know. Is, is Ram the Wash equivalent? I am a petal on the wind. Watch me fly for a window. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Tim, your least favorite scene. Oh, my least favorite scene is the one where near the end where they return and uh, who's the what's the black girl's name again? Tanya. 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 Tanya is well. For April is like, what's going on? Is like, oh yeah, there are petals. Can you do something about that? And uh, then April's like, what do you expect me to do? And I'm like, my God, do I have to spell it out for you? <laughs> you know, it's like... You got superpowers! Use them! <laughs> yeah. God! And, and also, April seemed to be, like, taking her sweet time saying that, you know. It's I like, think April's sitting here like, all I want to do is fuck Ram. Mm -hmm. Don't want to deal with this shit. Round two, ding. Oh, there are <laughs> shadows kill petals. And it's like, what, do you need finger puppets to... <laughs> <laughs> do we need to put on a play for you? Do we need a show? Did you not get one plus one equals two? Yes. It's like... Can you stop making doe eyes for two minutes yeah, and pay attention? <laughs> For having Although, the brain of a king who is a mastermind tactician and fighter, you really don't get the grasp of this very quickly? Although, I still think the solution to killer petals is a flamethrower, personally. <laughs> yeah. Which, again, having unit marching around with flamethrowers would have been Yes, I would have liked moment. to see... I li like to see hu unit in, like, thermal hazmat it, suits... Someone could have even had a doctor moment and yell at them about how ham-fisted it was or something. Thing is, though, these things aren't flame retardant as far as we know, so it'd actually probably be pretty effective. No, but the no, the only problem is it would also burn down the buildings that they're covering. 
If you went close enough to the buildings, yes. I'm it sure you'd have to be, do though, something else. It for would be, up. though, a typical ham fisted unit response. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Another character could yell at them, and then. I would they, like. I, eventually, they would come up with an alien response. Like I, like I said, I'd love to see them in the outfits. Only they have the little unit beret on top, and they're yes. <laughs> torching everything. <laughs> oh, units! Never get rid of that beret. <laughs> just oh wear the beret properly, because I seem to remember there was at least one episode where they just botched, mangled the beret, and <laughs> I don't remember which one though. I can see them marching up the street now. Someone's huddled over, covered in flower petals, and they just light him on fire. They're like, nope, he's dead. Eh, he's already dead. He's collateral damage. <laughs> Chopper petals there. Five rounds rapid. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, so my God, that's even more funny. Watching <clears throat> unit soldiers walking down the street shooting the flower petals. <laughs> <laughs> and still, just and still missing. And still missing. Never thought I'd shoot an anger at flower petals. <laughs> All right, so who are we up to for least favorite? We what? did who Bill. Went? Okay, we did Bill, so that's we me. Did, no, we did. We did. Uh, did we? I don't think uh, we did Bill. No, did we, we did not do Bill. Oh, okay. I thought we did do you. I commented no. on other people's things, but I know I had my Maybe. scene set, and it's, we haven't mentioned. So... Okay, then, then spit it out. Is, is it me? Okay. Yeah. Must be you, the then. scene, and I hope I'm not stealing Rand's. The scene where an annoying lady in the red dress is like, "Oh yeah, they only had like one and a half souls anyway. So really, if we had just explained that to him in the first place, he probably would have done what we wanted without that entire uh, episode of stalling." So why didn't you do it? Right. <laughs> yeah, and that was mine. <laughs> I was so pissed off. I'm like, so you've been wasting our time for the entire time. Yeah, and that and that was part of that same scene um, where she broke into the car, where she's like, yeah, yeah, we predicted you do this, <laughs> and we predicted with a variance that this would happen or that he would choose to do this. But really, you know, the, and then it's like, really, you couldn't have tried this a different way, right? That would have so basic, completely flipped Basically, what she's saying is chances. it was all to see whether or not they could control Charlie and less about actually saving London or the world, <laughs> whichever one it was. And they don't really know about Charlie yet, but they do know that they can at least try to get to him. It was that was a it was a scene that just was made me even more go, you bitch. Right. Mm hmm. Oh, God. Which is why no. if she has any ties to Ian, I hope Ian Chesterton shows up just to relieve her of her job. You're fired. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I guess... Does then she I have, have a have name? To... I just keep calling her the lady in the red dress. I can't remember. Eventually, she's going to change clothes. And I had teacher. Fucked. That's all I can remember her as. Let's see if there's a listing. Yeah, I should probably look that up. <laughs> yeah, we're because apparently if she's going to be around, we're going to have to try to remember you know. her. Yep. Although with the mortality rate of class, for all we know, she mm -hmm. dies next episode. Yeah, I was going to say. I think uh, I think George R. R. Martin was hired as a consultant. <laughs> uh, Dorothea Ames. Dorothy Ames. Dorothea Ames. Dorothea. Dorothea. Yeah. So she doesn't that mean she's related to the Wicked Witch? Dorothea <laughs> Ames. The actress's name is Pookie Quenzel. Quesnel. <laughs> um. Yeah, that's all I know. Too bad it's not Pookie Quinzel. Yeah, I thought I thought it was for a moment. <laughs> But yeah, um, I hate her. <laughs> I <laughs> hate her dialogue. I hate her. Oh, like yeah. not even in a good, bad villain kind of way. Just it's bad. Yeah, <laughs> because I mean, basically, she has one per one emotion mode, and that's smug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Smug, or do what I tell you, which is still half and half smug. Mm-hmm. 
So no, no, I, I like my characters to have. I like my even my villain characters to have more of a range. Mm-hmm. She's obviously a figurehead for something. I would much rather rather see what that something is rather than having mm-hmm. this mid boss in our I way. Mean, even even what's her face, the head of uh, of Torchwood One, had she was smug, yes, but she was also she also had the arrogance. Mm-hmm. She had the, right. And she also had the oh my god, I'm in the presence of a celebrity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And she also had sure. the, the she also had the pride, and she also had the uh, devotedness, which also and even you, as a Cyberman came through. You kind of get the feeling though that you know this person, if the doctor showed up, should be like and. Yeah. We predicted you'd show up for this scenario. Right. To which the doctor's just like and annoyed with you already. I hope you die. Mm-hmm. He'd be like, and Especially Capaldi's doctor. Mm-hmm. Capaldi would be like, and she's not allowed to talk. Let's <laughs> do this. And then she says something. Why are you still talking? You know who she is? Hmm. It just occurred to me. She's Umbridge. She's Dolores Umbridge. <laughs> mm-hmm. I was actually just thinking Everything of her. I hate about Dolores Umbridge, I hate about her. I know I know the name. What is this from? Harry Potter. Uh, Harry uh-huh. Potter, book five or movie five, depending. Okay, that's why I know the name, but I can't place it. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'm pretty much, that was, uh, with Bill taking mine, I'm going to have to go for my least favorite bit to be the, uh, um, the kind of hackneyed, uh, chant that Charles has to give out while he's prepping the weapon. Oh, weapon which and must if... never be used. <laughs> I <laughs> beseech thee. <laughs> and I love Quill's reaction, though, on that, too. Quill's reaction like, was great, but I feel I, like I it's not even mandatory you... because he was perfectly able to stop in the middle and narrate what he was doing. He's like, I also he's like, counts it to free. <laughs> this, this, this exactly is exactly the, the thought that was going yeah. through my head. Like, this is the part where I stop and say who I want to use the weapon on. <laughs> <laughs> really? You're narrating? <laughs> the number of the counting shall be three. Thou shalt not count one, thou, nor shalt thou not count two. Five is right out. Right <laughs> <laughs> I used that line with somebody once, and they just gave me a blank look, and I'm like, <clears throat> "Uncultured swine." <laughs> <laughs> which is the where, which where, is the remark you should give back. Where, 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 which is it. you're you're among your people now, so we we most of us can quote Holy Grail forwards and backwards. Mm-hmm. I haven't watched it in about six months. I should probably watch it again soon. It's been a longer for me, but I it's it's I, I right after it so I marathon Flying Circus again. <laughs> I've watched it so many times, it's been drilled. Every scene has been drilled into my head. Do I have the special edition? I thought I had one of the special editions flying around somewhere. I'll have to look for it later. I've been known to use the intermission music on occasion for various things. (laughs) (laughs) All right. I've I've don't been using during like role playing games. All right. So you're all going to face the monster. What are how are you going to attack it? I'll give you a few moments to decide. Do 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 do. It's only a miniature. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, wow, we're actually doing fairly good for time here. Um. Anybody else want to say anything about the episode? Uh, for being overwhelmed with flower petals, it didn't seem like there were that many flower petals outside. I don't know. There was a person literally covered in them, and the next time there, we saw them, they were practically a skeleton. It depended on the scene convenience. When they needed to move from one place to another, there weren't a lot. But when they were looking outside to see the extent of the devastation, there were a lot. Mm-hmm. But it's like... I. I, I would have expected them to, like, look out the screen door and, like... Be, See like, them just cl- clinging to it? Yeah. Yeah. Like, just... It, yeah, it, it would have been nice to look out a door and it would be, like, snow in 
a uh, a northern Wisconsin February or something. Mm-hmm. Just watching them as they fall, keep falling in and start cluttering. Like you look out the window and the window is half covered in flower petals and they just keep piling up. Or like the huge pile, like that covers the that fills the entire doorway, like a side view of Scrooge's money bin. <laughs> flower petals. Still, I wonder how much each of those flower petals cost. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that they can buy them in the back load. Actually, I'm pretty sure most of the some of them at least were CGI. Oh, well, yeah. some, well, the 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 ones that were popping out of other ones. Yes. Yeah, the ones that the ones that were actively attacking and duplicating, definitely. Yeah, and so how much did each of those flower petals cost? I wonder. But I wonder how much it would cost to buy just you know a ten, a a big garbage bag full of cherry blossom petals from someone who has an orchard or something. I, guess I don't know. When did they a, film really this? Orchards, so well, it's releasing now, so they would have probably filmed this. I think it was in the fall. Yeah, like of in last the fall year. last year. Um. Yeah, cherry blossoms tend to bloom in the spring. Mm. <clears throat> Bloom in the spring when they, when I they, they fall they were though. Cherry blossoms. They kind of reminded me of orchid heads. And as I was saying, when do they fall too? Is the question not when do they bloom? Just just bloom, but when they are falling too, and also it depends upon the certain type as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not a cherry or grower, but I believe the uh, <laughs> the blossoms fall before the fruit grows. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So and the fruit's probably, ready by July. And and, and the, so probably somewhere at least in mid-spring for sure. Yep. Oh, the more you know. Well, I know cherries are ready by July because that's when the frickin' Door County cherries come around and <coughs> all over those. <sighs> Other than that, oh, uh... When when they weren't forcing Miss Quill to keep repeating "kill the Shadowkin," it was nice to get little touches of some more death on her too. I yeah. I am kind of hoping they they take the thing out of her so we can just find out how much of a queen bitch she can be. Yeah, it, it's starting to feel a little arbitrary. It's just like, meh. Nah, you have to follow these rules. I want to see her go on a total rampage. And then go to pretty much, I'm free now, go to kill Charlie and find out that she can't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd actually like to see her, like, kind of turn heel for, like, maybe the second to last episode and just go her own way doing whatever. But then suddenly realize she's still trapped on this planet and all of a sudden is under attack by something and have to I'm, finally, I'm willingly help the kids. I'm wondering if that's what we're going to see in episode seven. Seven or and what eight. Quill yeah. Del All right. Anyway, so we should move on to our final thoughts. And Matt, <laughs> you're up first. Final thoughts. Uh, so is just this episode in particular, yes? Yes. Final thoughts for just this episode, though Miles can give final thoughts for both. Okay. Since he was absent <clears throat> last week. I was also absent last week. Oh, okay. That's right. Then, that's right. So, yeah. Final thoughts for both of them, for both of you, but the rest of us will only do this episode. So, Matt, final thoughts for this episode. This episode in particular moved rel relatively fast. There were moments of dialogue, but at least the moments of dialogue were um, usually them either trying to figure out their next step or very quickly moving to the, where they needed to go. There was very little um, downtime, except for maybe when, when they were trying to convince uh, Charlie what to do next. Um, otherwise, the rest of it was at least spent doing something or trying to achieve a certain goal in the story that they needed to reach before everything tied back together. And I also like the fact that it was at least decently bookended as well, so everything was explained away for the most part. All right. Aaron? What um, was your thoughts about this one and the, and, uh, the last week's and this week's? I do like, um, I agree with Matt that it did move fast, but I also kind of like the, the character building, the world building that happened. Um, 
I kind of almost feel like this episode and the previous one may should have been kind of part of the series premiere, like somehow worked into the series premiere instead. Like having so, uh, so instead shaving. of going on to Monster of the Week, just have basically a three-parter dealing with the Shadowkin. Yeah, that would have been kind of cool. Maybe shave down some of the more draggy parts of the uh, first episode that don't really make sense and stuff. So I don't know then, if you could have and though. Then also, and then also cut the romance, or or have the romance for. <laughs> Blossom more in like the third episode when she defeats the Shadowkin, then that would be a reason. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Other than having such an abrupt beginning to it. All right. Is that all your thoughts? Mm hmm. All right. Miles, your thoughts on last week's and this week's? Um, I watched at both episodes about, you know, before, before the ep before we recorded. Um, the first, I liked a lot of the character stuff in the first episode, including the really awkward monster on monster sex scene, mm -hmm. um, which which ends with the Shadowkin asking if they can cuddle for a bit. Yeah. Um, any problems I have with the story, which I, which isn't much, is pretty much diffused by monster on monster cuddling. Um, it was, you know, it was a good story. Um, the second part, was, which was mostly action, moved pretty fast, and yeah, yeah, it was, it was a good, you know, it was a good two-parter story. Unlike a lot of two parts that we've gotten with New Who, it didn't drop. It kept the, it kept it all going and didn't drop the ball too much. All right. When Tim? two people in <laughs> when two people in rubber outfits love each other very very much. Tim, your this, thoughts for this week's? Yeah, this week's episode was uh, an okay episode. When it wasn't too expositiony, the dialogue was actually quite uh, platable, and uh, it was well paced. And I did like how they resolved uh, the whole dad story. And, uh, yeah, so this was a pretty good episode, I think. All right. Bill? I pretty much like this episode. I don't think I had any of the issues with it that I did with last week's. And I generally just felt there was a lot of really strong things to it. Uh, pretty much the only complaints that I have are the various plot and issues that cause it to be padded out. Actually... There is one thing that I forgot to mention earlier, which I will mention, and that's I don't get why the dads were not slaughtered mm -hmm. the second they stepped in the shadow world. But that's kind of a minor nitpick, and generally the padding, and actually yeah, that was kind of padding too. So generally the padding things that added the extra 10 or 15 minutes to this episode are the only issues I have with it. Otherwise, I think it was a pretty strong episode, and if it was... You know, if if it was kept as like a one and a half time length episode special or something, it would have been very strong. All right. So I felt this continued off of the last week's episode fairly well. It seemed to be pretty uh, um, well uh, hinged, if it was, or well, uh, well, it flowed well. Um, the pacing of this episode was okay, except for a couple places where I thought it was they should have got on with it. Special effects were good. Acting was was decent by the main cast. Um, I, I think the writer needs to write a little more depth into his secondary characters, and that does show in this, especially with the headmistress. Um, most of the secondary characters seem to be kind of one note acting and. I'd like to see a little more. You can tell the writer likes Ram's dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I meant more like the mm -hmm. villains and uh, the headmistress. Right. They seem to have just one note personalities. Yeah. And I would like a little more depth from my characters. So all in all, I think it was good, but not great. All right. So scoring. Again, we score on one to five. Uh, half points allowed. 
And Matt, I believe you're giving the first score. And remember, this is for last week's and this week's combined. Mm -hmm. There are some minor little tweaks that could have been done in both, but neither story was particularly bad. So I'm guessing on an average, I'll give it a four. Four average. All right. Um, I believe Aaron was next. Mm -hmm. I think I'm also going to give this a four as, like I said, the world building and character building and the intense act or the fairly intense action was, was pretty good. All right, Miles. Um, I'm going to have to also be very boring and also give it a four. Um, there was good action in part two and good characters and very good character stuff in part one. Um, more could you ask for? All right. Tim? I won't go against you guys. I'll give it a four. Wow. This might be unanimous. It, it's averaging out to about a 3.8, which is, you guessed it, a four. <laughs> Yeah, and it's unanimous because I also said it was good but not great. So I'm going to have to give it a four. And that will, out of six people, all giving it a four, average this one at 4.0. Wait, wait, carry, carry the four. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Well. <laughs> and, and it all comes out to, nope, nope, it's a, nope, it's a four. Oh, so... They're coming to oh, take me it. away. Ha ha. They're coming to take me away. Ho ho. He he. Ha ha ha. I'm sorry. Yeah, I hear I, the I, sirens I, and I have to. Ah, <laughs> eh, well, you know, living on a main drag. Yep. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't know yeah. about that anymore. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live equidistant between a volunteer fire department, a hospital, and the police station. So you know all about the sirens. Police yep. station from here is about two uh, block and a half down. Fire department is also a, a block and a half the other direction. And I think the ambulance is about a block away from the police station in a different direction as well. Small town. All right. So co-owner of Lonely Heart with a 4.0. Uh, out of 177 things we have reviewed now, uh, we'll come in at number 73. It is on par with Destiny of the Doctor, Hunters on Earth, Light at the End, Planet of the Spiders, Rose, Stage Fright, Heaven Sent, Torchwood Everything Changes, Terminus, Trial of the Valiard, a Good Man Goes to War, Runaway Bride, Attack of the Cybermen, and Vengeance on Barros. It is better than Warrior's Gate, Into the Dalek, Technophobia, Blink, Monster of Peladon, The Next Doctor, The Chase, Guardians of the Dead, Ghostlight, where it's right in our big category. And right below, Army of Ghosts, Doomsday, Curse of Fatal Death, Mummy and the Orient Express, Death to the Daleks, Under the Lake Before the Flood, State of Decay, The Chaos Pool, Closing Time, The Girl Who Died, and The Brink of Death. Oof, that is a big list. I'm going to have to start getting to a point where we'll just mention top fives in those particular categories. Yeah, well, the four, that area around four is our biggest section, so. Yeah. Number 73 on our list right now. Co-owner of a Lonely Heart, Bravish Heart. And that, I believe, is all we have to say about that. Bill? Okay. Uh, if uh, you enjoyed listening to us, and we didn't even ramble too much, so I can't even say if you enjoyed listening to us ramble. Oh, we uh, rambled. Please... <laughs> We yeah, we got we got it done pretty quickly though in terms of the the Despite review. Despite the rambling, yes. <laughs> uh, but please go ahead and uh, like the video to show your support and get it so people can see us and uh, subscribe so you can see us on YouTube and Twitch. You can also uh, like and follow. Uh, for some reason, I always get those. I always forget those too on Facebook and Twitter. 
And if you want to support us, you can head on over to patreon.com slash unearthlypodcast or gofundme.com slash mibspain. Yep. And on next week's show, our class is sent to detention where things happen. What we what happens, we're not sure, but it's probably Miss Quill's fault. It's Detained, written by Patrick Ness and starring the class cast at all. See you then. See you all Bye. next time. Good evening. Bye-bye.